Bob Egan. Thanks. Hello. I, I've got a, I don't, I don't think I need that, right? You can all hear me. So, um, <clears throat> it's a pretty sad day to see that only Doug and I are the only two people who actually have blackberries. <laughs> I can remember starting off uh, with the, the original founders of that company who were working in a, in a small, you know, uh, retail storefront uh, putting together modems. That's what they originally started building. Uh, for Motorola first and then a company called 3Com later. Uh, and then Bell South approached them to build these, what, what were a little more than a two-way paging device uh, in the late 90s um, to put on a, a network that was then called uh, Mobitext. And Motorola followed and said, hey, well, we also want to do it on our data tech network. And that's sort of what launched uh, the, the company. <coughs> As well as we'd like. Okay, so let me find that. My, I guess I will use it after all. Um, I'm, I'm working on about 90 minutes of, uh, of sleep, so if I p appear to have Alzheimer's, it's uh, <laughs> throw something at me and I'll get, I'll get restarted. Uh, I've got a bad cold and caught up in a lot of the travel. Um, so, you know, the, the, the whole mobile and wireless network uh, evolution uh, has, has come a long way, it feels like, but I, I think we're actually just getting started. I was saying to someone the other day that when you think of the digital exhaust as associated with mobile and wireless in, in human evolution terms, um, you know, in, we started out all fours, we discovered fire, we discovered language, we discovered tools, and we you know, eventually started walking upright. And now think about the kids on the beach. They're bent back over, right? And probably most of us um, too. So we're not fully upright uh, in the mobile marketplace. Before I go too much further, uh, I'd like to get a sense of who's in the audience and really uh, what's on your mind. I have like 25 slides. Your challenge is to not let me use any of them. Um, so what, what's on your mind? What, uh, what do you want to know about? Uh, how many? How many people use their phones or tablets at work for things like email? A few. How many of you are in like a regulated market like financial services? Real estate? Uh, healthcare? Not a healthcare on the cape. Uh, how many are familiar with the term BYOD, bring your own device? How many of you actually bring your own device as opposed to the company actually paying for your device? Who, which would you prefer? How many people would rather bring their own device and pay for it versus the company paying for the device and you still being able to? Yeah, everybody does, right? Um, how many are, would consider yourselves small businesses, small business owners? Oh, great, good, okay. So let me, let me sort of focus on that small business market. How do you build a, a mobile strategy? How many of you have built an application uh, or had somebody in your organization build an application. Yeah, I saw you coding over there earlier, yeah. Um, how many over the next year or two have it on your radar maybe to build an application for customer employee use? Wow, that's pretty, oh, three or four people, that's it, that's interesting, okay. Um, what sort of anxieties do you have around mobile? Anybody want to offer up uh, I read recently, I think it might have been in the Wall Street Journal, that uh, uh, an employee of a company had the BYOB um, uh, policy. Yep. So he had his phone. When he got um, terminated, uh, the company was able to wirelessly go and erase his entire, all the information on his entire device. Right. Even though it was his, it was under his name, even though you know, he, had, he had purchased the device through Verizon. Wireless. Yeah. And uh, it was a shock to him, and then he realized that there was some agreement that he signed at the beginning uh, that gave them permission to do yeah. that, even though it was his device. Uh, you might want to comment. On yeah, that. so that's, a, that's an area called mobile device management, and there are four or five very large companies in that space. Uh, one called AirWatch, with uh, the VMware just bought Mobile Iron, IBM bought a company called FiberLink, and they all have that capability. What's interesting is that when you do uh, 
buy your own device and you bring it to work and you get email or perhaps other work-related applications on it, um, by definition, uh, enrolling yourself into that program, you basically release all your rights to that device. All of them. Now, if the company's smart and they configure these MDM uh, tools correctly, and only about half do it, uh, you'll find that um, they don't have to necessarily delete all of your contacts and all of your pictures. The pictures is really the big one. People get pretty upset with that. Um, we also see the opposite. Um, people use uh, Salesforce uh, applications, for example, and they get enrolled in the company, but then they leave and the company forgets to go and de-roll them. And so what happens is a year or two later, they're still, still prospecting out of the, the old company's database. So you see a lot of that going on. So there's two sides to that point. But you know, this whole MDM market is, is sort of you know, based on a lot of charlatans, right? It, it is old, old time IT, which was very much a command and control mentality. And um, you know, when you got laptops or you're set at your desktop, they, they, they made a master image of what programs you were going to have. You had your username and your passwords. And the early days of mobile, they sort of extended that model. And so they didn't necessarily put lots of malware and antivirus because there were really no antivirus problems on, on phones and their structured operating systems wise completely different. But they did put a lot of controls on there because IT uh, looked at it in, uh, in a notion of paranoia and increased risk. And, um, you know, they're, um, from an IT standpoint, they're really focused on managing risk and protecting the brand, right, and protecting the intellectual property. And so when everybody loses their phones and taxi cabs, the first thing that goes off is, oh, I better get control of this stuff. And unfortunately, as people come and leave from the company, they just took that same model and sort of rolled it in. And, and people only now are beginning to wake up to realize just how bad that is. Now, the interesting thing about that is that when you're using Google or you're using like Wi-Fi here and everything else, you've, you've kind of lost privacy anyhow because you're creating lots of digital exhaust and your phone is broadcasting your location in multiple ways based on the network address, Comcast address, GPS address, the browser, the applications all have little agents that call home on a regular basis. And so increasingly companies are getting even more paranoid, um, not just about what pictures you have and how they control that, but also the kinds of applications that are on there because in the days of desktop they could vet all those applications. They made lots of decisions about Here's the applications we need for work. And uh, in the early days, and I, I say early days, since about 2007, because iPhone really uh, changed the, you know, the whole paradigm, what we found was that uh, all, all of a sudden, uh, everybody wanted whatever they wanted to have. And uh, it reminded me of the hippie generations of the 1960s, right? Free life, do what I want, when I want, with what I want, my way. And so there's been this tension that's gone on between companies large and small. You see it in the school systems, you see it in healthcare, uh, and certainly in the regulated uh, industries as well. But increasingly, as we're approaching about 20% of penetration, in other words, if you're a thousand person company and 200 people are now using this stuff, we're beginning to get uh, a, a lot, lot more discussion around the privacy issues and the control issues and, and maybe beginning to evolve how IT works with its employee and, and its customer and partner constituencies to do something um, uh, quite different. Anybody else have uh, some anxieties? Did you have some? I was wondering why you asked when people have Blackberries. Uh, well, Doug asked, actually asked that question. I think it's because he and I were talking about Blackberries. Uh, so l let me ask, how many people have iPhones? Yeah. How many people have Androids? How many, okay, so those people who have Androids, uh, how many are, are, are using them at work? Uh, almost the same population. Healthcare, some education markets, financial services, they don't allow Androids because they're, they're, uh, they're tough to manage and they're, they're pretty insecure. <laughs> unless you're buying the Samsung safe devices. Uh, how about Windows phones? Oh, there you go. I like Windows phones. I, I carry a couple of them. Okay, so 
lots of operating systems, lots of diversity, and that really sort of lays into some of the importance of, of um, what's taking place in the mobile market. A little bit uh, about me, you saw the formal thing, but mobile's really in my DNA. The first time I got electrocuted, I was trying to measure the plate voltage on a, on a TV and got knocked on my butt. Um, I was really the uh, ultimate unappreciated geek at high school until uh, the girls found out that I could make phone calls from my ham radio in, in the car, my old 54 Chevy. The first time I fell off a roof putting an antenna up um, was around 1970. Uh, you know, you, you, how many people know Larry the Cable Guy? <laughs> I am that guy, right? He may be heavier. He may be heavier at somebody turning that audio up. Uh, he may be a lot heavier and, uh, and, and m much richer and famous than I am, but you know, I was the guy that, is Comcast here? I know they're sponsoring. All right, so I was the guy that was really building the black boxes and selling them to everybody. So the police chief would come and the mayor, and I bought my first house uh, on that stuff. Um, and then I cracked the Gerald encryption, and that sort of set off a whole nationwide uh, epidemic. And um, how I actually got into this on a professional standpoint is I was working for the, I was a chief technology officer at DEC, working in advanced technology area. And uh, Ken Olson saw, saw this stuff coming out of NCR called wireless LANs that were being developed for the military at 900 megahertz back in those days. And so he, I was running the electromagnetic sites where we were measuring interference and, uh, and doing some Tempest work that would allow people not to be able to actually spy with antennas on, on computers, right? And so he, he was in the parking lot and he saw the, all these antennas on the car. And he goes, all right, so there's probably the guy that could head up our wireless effort. So <laughs> that's what happened. I'm still doing it, and Ken has, has since uh, moved on to better pastures. A little bit about Seferin Group. Um, this is, a, as uh, Doug said, this is my, actually it's my fourth startup, but, but second consultancy. There's three parts of the business. We do advisory research for mostly large companies, but my passion is to work with, with small businesses and startups. And, in fact, uh, the reason that Kate and, and Paula won Startup Weekend is because they had a good coach. <laughs> uh, we do a lot of market intelligence. Uh, I'll show you some of that, but we, we try to take a look at you know, the big trends in the market in terms of user adoption uh, and um, you know, try and make some predictions going forward. And uh, we also do some consulting. On the consulting side, um, we work with four of the top largest banks around the world, uh, three out of the top five insurance companies, uh, all the major uh, high-tech companies, the SAPs, the Cisco's. And uh, this was incubated here on the Cape. Kathleen uh, over there uh, has recently joined the company, so she probably want to sell you something, I don't know. <laughs> um, so I, I think as we approach uh, uh, 2014, the, the real mantra here is, is if you're going to build a mobile strategy, the first thing you have to do is decide not to build an app. You really have to think beyond the app. Now, why do I say that? I say it for a number of reasons, um, but it really has to do with how do you actually use mobile devices to get something done? It's not about email. I mean. You can put email on your devices at work and you can spend all day in email at your desktop or on your phone or on your tablet. Will you make any money? No way, right? Email is just a time sink. There's no way to actually make money in email. You can collaborate in email, right? Um, and so the first thing that everybody does is they enable email. And then the second thing is they say, well, I gotta have an app. And so then they go out and build apps. <clears throat> but the interesting stats are that 25% of the apps never get downloaded, ever. People in the US, these numbers are a little bit different uh, elsewhere, but in the US, think about yourself, you've downloaded 33 apps or less throughout the entire lifetime of the device that you own. And you probably use only seven of them on a pretty regular basis, not counting email. So you have to ask yourself, given those stats, why run out and build an app for your business right away, right? Now it's important to think about what do you want to get as a return on investment by making investment in mobile? 
there's not a good return on investment simply to run out and spend $25,000 a screen plus creative design uh, that depending on the size of your organization will be between $250,000 and a million dollars. Um, it's really tough to make money just doing mobile device management thinking that you're going to get out from underneath buying everybody devices. Um, but then all the extra security, you know, Frank talks about biometrics, but uh, you know, in, the, in addition to that, managing the devices, setting up the policies, um, putting applications on where maybe they're third-party applications, and you've got to figure out how to support them. And maybe the problem's not your application or not your system, but the infrastructure. Uh, when we did the mobile banking application for Bank of America, one of the most surprising things was that when people were having a problem with mobile banking, who do you think they called? Any guesses? What's that? Yeah, they called the bank. More often than not, it had something to do with the network or the phone itself, but all of a sudden the bank found themselves into troubleshooting phones. <laughs> troubleshoot my bank balance for a change, figure out where my money goes, and I, I could get that, right? Um, <clears throat> think about what you do today. Uh, through mobile phones, uh, most people are, are sort of moving from the habits they have on their desktop um, to mobile phones. They're using a the browser. How many of you do Google search and other browsing on your phones today? There you go, right? And so, Again, why invest in a native application? Now, there's some good reasons to invest in native applications if you're going to go out and market to that audience, right? But you're going to have to spend some money to do it. Elsewhere, figure out how to do responsive design or some sort of hybrid because people are still taking the habits that they have by using browsers and coming you know, to your website. So if they know your website is you know, www.capecodcupcakes.com, well, they're going to go there first. They're not going to go into the app stores to find out if you have an application. And so, now the $150,000 you spent on developing the application, where, where's the return? How many people play games on their phones? Wow. Not too many here. I, I don't either. In fact, I try and delete them. I was pretty upset when Apple wouldn't let me take that game center off. How about Facebook? There you go. Way down the other end, 2% is productivity. <laughs> so we're spending over a billion dollars a year uh, in developing mobile strategies and in, in fixing infrastructure, yet we're not really working with employees to get the kind of return on investment that we could. Now, the reason for that is simple. Most companies ran out and did what? They built an app, <laughs> right? So, um, the other thing is, there's a lot of talk about mobile first. It's really not about mobile first, especially if you're in the retail sector in some way, right? Um, people will start and stop irrespective of what the screen is. You know, they may see something on TV, uh, maybe move over to a tablet, be on their desktop, and, and when they re-enter the site, they want whatever they were doing to still be around, right? Stock, retail stock is a perfect example, right? Fidelity has, has spent millions of dollars, literally, trying to get very smart about what your preferences are based on the screen, the po point of entry that you have, right? The tablet versus the phone versus the desktop. If you think about your, your natural habits, if you're on the phone, what are you most likely to do? if you're waking up to the Fidelity website or any retail brokerage. Yeah, you're looking at the stock numbers, right? So phones are very transactional. Maybe you manage your 401k or tax statements or something else at the desk, but when you get to the phone, it's more likely very transactional and it's about getting a, a stock price. The tablet is somewhere in between. But the most interesting thing is that in increasingly, you're going to have responsibility in your small businesses, it's already happening in large businesses, to do something about sensing that point of entry. And the first time you mess it up, you've alienated the hell out of the customer. 
they won't come back. So it's not just about mobile first, it's about mobile also. It's, a, it's really uh, uh, a multi-screen environment. Yeah, I got a sure, yeah. yeah. Why is it that adware will come back anyway? Badware, yeah. <laughs> why why when, when it's something you don't want, you get it back, and something that you may want, you can't get it back? Yeah, you know, that really happens at the desktop, and increasingly it's happening by, by bad ad brokers um, that are now beginning to infiltrate, you know, the, the freeware apps and also the browsers. Um, I, I think Apple and others and Samsung are trying to do something about it. Um, the good companies are making it a, a lot more relative and a lot more contextual, right? And so what they're doing is they're taking that geographic information. Um, they're moving beyond what, for example, Google does today, which is by and large sort of looking at the, um, uh, the tracks in the snow. And based on the tracks in the snow, say, oh, we, we think that person is, ha has these sort of preferences moving along these lines, right? And, and, and moving in a direction to get a lot more predictive Right. So if you think about what Amazon does, how many people have bought from Amazon? How many people, when you bought from Amazon, got a thing that said, oh, and you know, people who bought things like you just did also bought this, 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 and this. Right. So they have this, this uh, technology called ontologies, which is, is sort of an artificial intelligence and an infrastructure that, that does all that intelligence and gets a lot more predictive about what you're doing. That's beginning to happen in mobile, but it's still a long ways off. I see that happening, but I also see the inability to unsubscribe to these things because they're being sponsored by browser companies and stuff like that, which right. is totally uh, different than what it, the 800, you know, put the number in and right. they won't dial you. So right. I don't kind of, it doesn't make sense to me when they're in, inconsistent. Well, they're not inconsistent in that a browser is a browser, a browser, irrespective of what platform's on it. You know, they, they don't necessarily have all the capability, like some browsers support Flash and, and some don't. But, you know, in terms of ad space, they, they look and feel very similar. Now, there are some private browsing uh, scenarios, you know, browsers that you can put on phones that eliminate some of that. But, but by and large, especially in the retail sector and very often in the, elsewhere in the consumer sector, it really is about you know, a pay for play around ads. And, um, and it's really no different than it's happening in the desktop. And you can't get out from underneath it. In fact, there's a whole ecosystem. If you look, I don't have the numbers with me, but if you look at um, a lot of the data around who's making money because they're building apps and putting them up in the app store, a lot of it is 99 cents or less or the free ones, because the free ones are making money by just creating all kinds of ads. And it's, it's, it's all about eyeballs. And they're, you know, they're running the risk to say, oh, if I have a million eyeballs hit this thing, and uh, I can attract 50 people, and I can charge them 20 bucks a piece on something, then I can make money. I mean, it is. Killing time. Well, it's killing your time. Yeah, you bet. But I put that all in this bucket. I call it digital exhaust. And, you know, when you think about it, in fact, I, I think, uh, so we're, we're coming into this thing I call the perfect storm. And, and um, I think it, it's about these three areas. And let me, let me talk about why I think that's true. First, this, if you, if, you've, if you think you've seen innovation in devices so far, certainly Apple has done great packaging innovation. Uh, they pretty much invented touch on glass. They built a fabulous store. Um, when you look at these companies, there's sort of three, right? There's plumbers, poets, and then everybody else is sort of panders. The ad guys are all panders, right? Um, Apple is very good at buying and implementing technologies to create the poetic experience. Microsoft has some of both. They just can't figure it out. I don't know that the CEO I know him pretty well. I just don't know that he knows how to detangle that and decide whether Microsoft's going to be a plumber or a poet. Samsung's got the same problem uh, across multiple divisions, right? Um, but the one thing you can be assured is that 
they're going to con all of these companies will continue to build stronger ecosystems and we're going to continue to see explosion in all kinds of device types. We really are just getting started around that. In terms of overall growth, 18%, 36%. I mean, these are big, big numbers. I think this month, it turns out that we have more people carrying mobile phones or mo more, more, more mobile phones and, or devices in the, uh, in, the, in the wild than there are people on the planet. Yeah, <laughs> and I'm, do, I'm doing my share. So we're going to continue to see this, this growth and in innovation. And a lot of it is that, you know, semiconductors are getting cheaper and cheaper. Um, and anybody here do investment in stock portfolios or PCs? All right, it's a tough market when you think about the semiconductors because the prices are going down, but you're getting more and more power. I mean, think about the... the, the the color screens, the raw horsepower, these great cameras. You buy all this stuff for $199 subsidized, right? We're going to see more and more of that. I think the next big innovation probably happens in, uh, in the barrier. But um, the other thing is this whole Internet of Things. The, this 2014, it'll be, you'll hear about sensors everywhere. Think about healthcare. Where is the, 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 the least comfortable place to get well is also the most expensive. Where is that? Um, the most comfortable and the least expensive is where? What do you think can bridge that? Technology, Technology mobile in particular, and sensors. Uh, I spoke at the healthcare conference down in, in Washington a, a month or so ago, and I am I'm not usually surprised at what I see, but I am so surprised when I was down there looking at some of the technology and some of the innovation coming out of the healthcare market. And there's really sort of three big buckets. Uh, you know, the first has a lot to do with um, the wellness market. So how many of you carry uh, a jawbone or a, a y, y thing or any of these devices that count your steps? Anybody here have Pebble watches? Yeah. So that, that's sort of that, that whole wellness play. And we're going to see a lot more of that. Uh, the, 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 the second area is sort of this um, market that's getting a lot of money involved because there's this huge gap for us, the baby boomer generation, right? And we're building it for us because as we begin to retire, we're seeing uh, huge gaps in the availability of care against those of us who are going to need care. And so people are really rushing to try and make that all work. And then the third area is really about critical care uh, uh, stuff. So replacing a halter monitor, for example. How many people have had to wear a halter monitor at some point in their life? Yeah, there you go. So now your phone can do some of that. Diabetes, how many people have to measure their blood sugars, right? Phones can do that now. They have sensors that can tie to them. So you're gonna see, a, uh, I think, one of the big things. And that all sits in this area that, that's called the Internet of Things. And so if you're, if you're a small business and you're making an investment, um, it's important to think about what are the other applications that could make your business run well or do something relative to your employees or customers that, uh, that are more like zero touch. In other words, you don't have to get involved with anything hands on, that sensors or, or, or other things peripherally attached, either wirelessly or physically, to phones and tablets and, and even laptops um, can make your business uh, far, far, far more efficient. The other thing to watch for within your businesses, and large businesses are, are, are still beginning to learn that, is we talk about mobile, we talk about social like Facebook and Twitter and Instagram and all those areas, we talk about cloud computing, and we talk about this Internet of Things as if they're isolated components, when in fact, they're force multipliers against themselves. I guarantee you that those specs uh, that I mentioned to you earlier, where you've probably downloaded up, up, upwards to about 33 uh, applications on your devices, and you probably use seven, at least half of those seven have some sort of cloud interaction. Facebook is a prime example. That's a cloud service. How many of you use like Dropbox? Cloud service. Box.net cloud service, right? And so, 
Evernote, cloud service, right? And so that's also causing large companies and small businesses to rethink architecture. Do you really have to own on-premise equipment or you can, can you take advantage of servers and applications that are sitting up in the cloud rather than owning all this stuff? Rather than buying the big CRM package from SAP and buying a server and loading that so software and having to manage it. How many of you use Exchange Mail today? How many of you have that Exchange server on site that's managed at your location? And most people, right? No reason to do that. You should go to Office 365 and get rid of that infrastructure. Get rid of the IT people that are managing it. Don't need it. Re retrain them. Why does this keep going up and down like that? I'm not, I'm not like doing anything with it. Um, so, so the thing that, you know, as you're, as you're you know, thinking about your mobile strategy, it's not just about mobile, right? It's mobile plus cloud plus social interactions. Right, 18% of the time, people are using Facebook and Instagram and Twitter and all this other stuff instead of working. Right, um, and so you need to figure out what you want to allow, what sort of privacy issues are related to the the HR uh, governance that you have within your organizations, and 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 how do you actually get a return on the you know for every dollar invested? But it's not each of these in isolation, right? It's each of these collectively. Um, you know, once again, to reinfer cloud. Uh, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Can you just give us a definition of the Internet of Things? Because it seems to be a fairly new term that I've heard, but I'm not quite sure I've got a full grasp on it. So, we have this big thing called the Internet. <clears throat> and the way to think about the Internet is a pipe that stops everywhere, right? And there's servers that connect to it. That's sort of the web. The Internet is the conduit, it's the thing that brings water through the house. And then where you get, get that water um, and, and what you do with it is sort of the web. That, that's the content ar around all that, right? Now, the Internet of Things is everything that isn't quote unquote web, but uses the Internet. So it uses the Internet as a pipe, but it finds various entry points that are, are not um, uh, traditional. Right? So people don't look at smartphones as an Internet of thing. They look at it as a smartphone. But if you're building uh, a pipeline and you're measuring uh, oxygen layers or, or, or gas leaks or uh, ionization, that sensor would fall into the category of an Internet of Things. Because it's a sensor that's using the Internet, but it's not sort of this whole web browser interface. So anything that are sensors um, definitely fall into the category of an internet thing. Um, people are taking like Google Glass and throwing that into the hopper and saying that's an internet of thing. The cameras, I don't know, how many of you have wireless cameras in your house for security? That would be considered an internet of thing. When you think about healthcare, monitoring your blood pressure remotely or having it monitored remote, that would fit in the category of the internet of things. It's using the internet as a transport and it's using some sort of sensorization uh, to do something else. So like the uh, Nest, the company that you just purchased with that? Right, you know, John Landry was here talking about, you know, a two-product company having a billion dollar valuation and he couldn't understand it. And literally like a week later the company got bought, right? This was about the patents, but yeah. So, so wireless thermostats, smoke detectors would fit in that category of things. Yep. Pretty much anything that's not a phone or a tablet or a laptop, notebook, portable device, and not a TV, and not a radio, not a telephone. Like there's desktop telephones that are voice over IP. They'll put them in the category of things. This is a really naive, I shouldn't probably ask it, but I'm going to ask it anyway. Yeah. Is the internet one, you, you, you described the pipeline, okay? Is, is, the, in, is the internet as it, as it could be a defined one thing, or is it a combination of browsers, or what is, what is the internet? So, 
the internet, think of the internet as a pipe, just like a water pipe in your house. And that's the internet. Um, Who has that? Who owns that? So the telcos all own it. The telcos, the, the telcos, so the Verizons of the world, the old MCIs, the Sprint, the AT&Ts, they, they own and operate all that. In Europe, it's Vodafone, or actually around the world, in many countries, it's Vodafone. So, so the internet, lay, it started with government, actually it started in education, then government. So, so there's this interconnect, I mean, it's a physical in, 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 interconnect. Um, and just, but but think, of a, you know, think of it as a pipe, right? Browsers are, are sort of the web, right? So, so they scan for content where um, servers or computers are attached to the pipes. And you can extract things, a document, a watch a video, whatever. And if you're using it through a browser, it's called the web. So the web is the content that rides on the pipe, okay? Now, just to hurt your brain a little bit more than that, is that the internet is um, not physically broken, but, but it is uh, fragmented by address allocation. So if you look, for example, we have on our street, you know, house number one, house number 16, odds on one side, evens on the other. The internet has the equivalent of that as well, and they're called segments. In fact, as you're building small business solutions with your phones, you're, you're going to run into the problem where people are complaining about performance. And part of that performance is that as they're driving in their car, getting on and off an airplane or, or whatever it might be, the fact is that the phone has to keep changing its address. It's still on the internet. The browser is still looking for the same stuff, but the infrastructure, the house address is changing all the time. And that, that creates delay, it, take, it takes latency. And if there's network congestion, or in some cases, how many people have heard these terms IP4 versus IP6? The part of the issue, we're running out of address space in IP4, so they have to wait for somebody to sort of get deprioritized because they didn't have enough address space. And that's why we moved to IP6. So we had a lot more address space and we can support you know, a, a lot of different modes. It's to reduce that latency. I, I have an iPad that doesn't have uh, phone service. Does it have what? Doesn't have phone service. Yeah. I, I have to connect through Wi Fi. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, am I going to ATT? I mean, I, I don't know who, or am I going, where am I going? Well, if you're at home, and you have Wi-Fi at home, oh, okay. um, and Comcast is your internet provider, they're bringing that broadband pipe into your home, okay. then you're going over Wi-Fi, okay. right, which is a wireless pipe, right? So it depends where I am. And just look at Wi-Fi as a wireless extension to this broadband pipe we call the internet. In fact, what I, what I tell people is, you know, they, they, they would like to replace all their infrastructure with Wi-Fi. The job of Wi-Fi is to make you get the shortest path from an untethered device to a wire place somewhere, right? Because there's lots of interference, uh, people can spy on your stuff, whatever. But when you think about your mobile phones going over a wide area network, it's a, it's a wireless link. When you think about using Wi-Fi, that's a wireless link. It's just a, a wireless extension to this pipe that we talk about um, that's running uh, and attached to all these servers. Yep. Uh, a couple of related questions. What do you see happening to the cost of the mobile broad broadband service? Yeah. And will we ever get to the point where I can take my, my mobile device, if I get sick of AT&T and go to Sprint and Verizon or whoever it might be? Yeah. So there's, there's sort of two questions there. The, the first is okay. that, um, The, in the U.S., really, um, we still have a fragmented set of technologies. Um, one group of companies, AT&T, for example, lined up with what they use in Europe, this network called GSM. And so 
in Europe especially, this GSM woke up and all the European countries got together, even, even the Eastern companies, uh, countries for the most part, and said, we're all going to use the same technology. And um, in the US, we had something different. This company called Qualcomm said, you know what, instead of using what the Europeans are doing, I want to do something different. And there was a telco, an ex-Bell company called AirTouch out in California, said, yeah, so we'll buy it. And then Verizon bought it. And then Sprint bought it. So you had three companies went and bought into this thing called CDMA. OK? Completely incompatible with all the GSM that was used in 80% of the world. So uh, it's the first time I actually saw the US go backwards. Now, 15 years later, we've kind of come full circle. And now people don't realize that this, these networks that you're hearing LTE, and one of the reasons why you see these Verizon ads, where they have people stand in front of the, you know, the ads and they go, so who has the best LTE coverage? It's because once we got to LTE, there's combinations of the CDMA and GSM all built into it. What they don't tell you is based on the property, there's also some incompatibilities with LTE based on other companies that they bought. But by and large, um, 4G gets us close from a technology standpoint to have that kind of roaming portability. In fact, if you buy an iPhone from Verizon today, you have worldwide compatibility. If you buy an iPhone from AT&T, it will not work on Verizon's network, assuming you've got it unlocked and tried to provision it there, because it doesn't support the underlying CDMA technology that they still use for voice. Now, Verizon's making the upgrade to something called VoIT. It's a term that instead of um, continuing to carry the legacy of the phone that you have in your house, right? Um, I don't know, how many people still have phones in their houses now that I think about it? I don't have one, I haven't, a lot of people do. But the bottom line was, is that um, you, you had a hardwired setup connection. And mobile phones today still have a setup link. You own that channel, you own that link. How many people have Vonage? Wow, nobody here. Wow. I don't use them either. But. <laughs> Uh, how many people use Skype? Yeah, all right. So Skype is what they call an OTT play over the, you know, over the top. And so it's an example where voice is uh, converted to something that the internet knows how to put across its pipe and somebody knows how to receive it. It's shared. It's shared across the broadband. So unlike your phone today, which says, I have to set up a channel and dedicate a channel. You have to set up a channel so that you and I can talk. Voice over IP services allow multiple people to share that same broadband without stepping on top of each other or even hearing each other. That's why Skype is, is so cool, right? Just one second. And so um, within the next year to 18 months, we'll finally get close enough on the voice side, which is really the problem, and the data side, which is almost not a problem anymore, that would allow people to move between carriers, technically. Technically. But there's not a carrier anywhere in the world that wants to let that happen. There's too much windfall associated with the carrier lock. Now, Legary from T-Mobile is trying to change that, right? I mean, this, this, guy, this guy is a, a guy out of the wild, wild west, right? And we'll see what he has to do. But, um, but, but it's still a few years off, technically, because of the voice. Will it still be as expensive? No, so that's the, the thing you're seeing is prices come down, right? Uh, in, my, in my case, I have like, I think I have five numbers provisioned right now, maybe six. But I was, I was my bill was like $450 a month. Uh, and part of the reason I have it is I, I get all the latest devices and we plug them in, we take a look at them, and then we send them out. Um, I, I 
called up AT&T when they did the new share plans, and my bill is now like 105. Huge. If you haven't taken a look at these new share plans, Verizon started it, then T-Mobile jumped in, and now AT&T has actually made two, two different changes. Jump on those plans. Jump on them fast. Well, so, so uh, the, the first thing that happens is that you buy a plan that's, let's say, 40 bucks, and you're going to get a reasonable amount of data, one gigabyte. For most people in this room, one gigabyte of data is fine, right? You're going to get unlimited calling, you're going to get unlimited text messaging, and unlimited number of pictures that you can send anywhere you want to send. For $10, for another phone, you share all that stuff. For $15, you can add a tablet on. And so instead of having to have a $40 plan for your phone, a $40 plan for your tablet, and on and on and on, they're allowing you to share, like large companies have, right? You know, I, I typically look at a thousand lines or more. I don't do so much of that negotiation anymore, but. You know, back then, we could buy X number of minutes and share them across a thousand users in a company. We could buy a terabyte of wireless data and divide that up across the users in a company. Consumers have never had that advantage. That's the biggest change, and that's what's been driving uh, the cost of service down. And we'll continue to see, see those um, costs come down. Because they're getting, the, the cost to produce a wireless data bit and the cost to produce a wireless minute is down by 10x just in the last three years. This move to 4G. And the, you know, there's a lot of things that you can bet on. You can bet that phones are going to get faster and cooler. You can bet that this cloud computing technology we talked about is going to get bigger and faster and less cheap, I mean, uh, less expensive. And the other thing is we started with 1G wireless, we went to 2G wireless, we went to 3. 3.5G, we're now at 4G. You know there's going to be a 5G, a 6G, and a 7G. And the increments um, usually mean for the carrier is that their cost to serve per bit is significantly lower. Like they want to see a 2X for every generation, right? Um, the reason that video is taking off is that the other thing they look for is to reduce the network delays. They call latency, right? And between 3G and 4G, we not only got more capacity and lower cost per serve, we took the delays on the network and dropped them by 5 or 6x, which made the ability to use Skype over a, a, a mobile phone. Like in the office, I shut off the wide area network. I, I don't even think about it. I'm, I'm doing Skype over Wi-Fi. That's my phone. That's my office phone. And so 4G really made that happen. Another question over here? Yeah. You know, with the introduction of VoIP over wireless and all those things, where do you see the push to talk on the iPhones and the Androids going? Nowhere. Nowhere. Yeah. Dead on arrival. Yep. Yeah, so we're, the question really was about, you know, Nextel was pushed to talk, right? Remember that? Everybody had Nextel push to talk? Yeah, I have a funny story. So the, the guy that ran all that for Motorola is a guy named Dennis Coombs. And every year, Dennis used to come to Providence to see me with the new portfolio of devices they were going to release on Nextel. And he always would bring about six devices. And the reason he brought six is he had one for me, one for my wife, and he knew I had a, a young daughter. And he wanted to get these devices into her and her friend's hands to see if they would last because they dropped them in the snow right, or whatever it was. And so... Um, when my daughter was in high school, I really liked using Nextel because when you used to press the push the talk button, it went up and tested the network, went and found the other phone, pinged it, came all the way back, and you heard a little beep. And so you knew the phone was on, you knew it was in coverage, and you knew the network was working. So this was great for four years in high school. <clears throat> Dennis shows up in an August. He usually came in February. August, he shows up. He said, hey, Jenny's going off to college, right? And I said, yep. So I got some new phones for you. So I'm thinking, wow, this is cool. This will be a good way to get used to the, her dorm mates and, you know, be a good in. And 
So I get the phones, I give her one, I pack the other ones up, I bring her up to college. You know, I'm, all right, dad's leaving, you know, halfway home, I'm, I'm, you know, feeling like I just lost something, you know, so I called her again and the network went beep, 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 yep, phone's on and coverage, hey Jen, yeah, hey dad, how you doing? Good. Get home, I'm home, okay, good. Next morning I get up, hey Jen, phone goes beep, 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 beep. Beep, 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 beep. She never answered anymore. So it was, it was like the worst moment of my life. I knew her phone was on, it was in coverage, and she had a great phone. But she, she had flown the coop. Um, so, I, I, how am I doing on time? I don't know where, uh, I mean, I can, I, I can. Uh, so how many of her, how many of you, uh, sure. I work with a lot of mid-sized companies. Yeah. One of the biggest anxieties that I have with working on in particular rolling out uh, wireless solutions yes. is that the IT departments try to control yeah. the strategy. Yes. And I'd like to see the half the business control the strategy. How can we overcome that? So, you know, I get... In respect to what you just said, if you're in IT, how can you go to the line of business and say, this is what I need to support the wireless strategy? From the, right. from the business side, it <clears throat> um, certainly show that there's return on investment with more. But from the IT side, how do they back that up and go, go get the budget? Right. Well, I think one of the things is that I talk about this thing called mobile cost of ownership. It really is an enterprise wide. So you have to get the stakeholders around the table. And, and it can't be bottom up, it can't be driven by IT. It has to be driven by corporate, and IT has to participate. And there has to be decision makers with budgets on both sides of the table. And you start here with, what's our strategy? And I try to break this down for companies to say, name for me five business pressures, right? And naturally, they're gonna break out that some have to do with the competitive environment, some have to do with sort of the connect activity demands of employees and what they have to get done. Um, some may be related to uh, business efficiency, um, what customers want, customer requirements, right? There's a lot of ways to get at it. But you've got to come up with a strategy and say, what are the five pressures in our organization? If you limit it to five, three are going to be inside and two are going to be external pressures, or three are going to be outside and two are going to be internal. So finally, you're forcing an organization uh, with all these people around the table to decide is their priorities based on external pressures or internal pressures. So that at least gives them all a common goal. Right? And every company is different. The second thing is to get them to say, well, what do we want to do about it? I call those strategic responses. Right? So if you think about you having a review today, if I took away all of your connectivity, how productive, how, how valuable to the company would you be? Uh, very valuable, right? On the other hand, if you're too connected, you'll probably get burnt out, right? Somewhere in the middle, and every business has sort of a different accelerometer there, right? It is the right balance of making the investment in mobile and wireless technologies um, that allow people to produce in a high value way, right? And so the next thing is to really understand what do you want to do about it, and why do you want to do it, right? And so, in fact, I, I even I think I have one I have it right here. So here, here's one I think, I think this was for a bank. Yeah, so this is for a bank, right? Um, so, so the bank, you know, I said, you know, give me what the five key business drivers, and if you look here, you can say, well, contain costs, manage risk, business process information, customer needs of now, and connected culture. So three were internally driven, and two were externally driven. And I said, all right, so what are you going to do about it? Well, first, they have to acknowledge that information mobility is going to be a key driver for growth and, and do, you know, make an investment. The second is customers are not going to be all on Apple, right? They are going to take advantage of the Internet of Things. They are going to be looking at TV. They are going to be using tablets and so on and so forth. And so they needed to plan for device diversity. Right, not get married to a single solution. Business process, figure out how to monetize the return on investment. Right, which means it's not, we're just not building 
mobile email. That's really what that translates to. And so, so why, what, and then start thinking about the technology. Too many companies try to do this. That's the recipe for disaster. Absolutely, I don't care what size company it is. And most people, this technology here, never took a look at trusted and untrusted devices. It never took about you know, security as a service or any sort of security mindset at all. It never looked at the agility infrastructure. It didn't look at the scalability infrastructure. It didn't look at you know, external internet capability versus internal local area network capacity and capability. In fact, if you take a look right now, what I say to companies, plan for 10 times more capacity to hit your internet service the minute you start turning on mobile service. Everybody comes to work, they, the desktops more often than not were left on overnight. They show up with their wireless phones and everybody's hitting all that capacity all at once. It's a huge problem. So that's what you have to do, right? You gotta get everybody on that and you gotta walk them through this. And, and what, I, what I tell them to do is to start with that strategy. And then once you've identified the strategy, you gotta go out and engage employees or engage customers to find out what's the right experience. What do they wanna do? I did some work with Florida Light and Power a few months ago. And there's some really, really smart people down there. And they came up with this grand scheme of all these features they're gonna have on the tablets. And I have to tell you, even for me, looking at those features, I was overwhelmed. I mean, yeah, there's a lot of neat stuff I could do, but 20% of it's what I'm gonna use, 80% is I'm not. Ah, oh, you guys said, no, no, we studied all this. I said, well, all right, let's get it out to the population and see. I was right. 80-20 rule never fails. And so we're moving from an environment where we had very you know, homogenous environment where everybody was using Windows at the desktop. And so we all had a shared experience, where, you know, including the blue, blue screen of death, right? <laughs> but, but we had a shared experience and we also had shared data, right? Mobile changes that paradigm to a personalized experience and share data, and that's the big difference. So you can't really just make decisions about what your customers are looking for or, or what um, your employees are looking for. And you have to understand that as fast as you want to make, make go, maybe your employees aren't ready for, for certain, to do certain stuff on mobile devices. And I spent you know, several months um, every night sitting on an iPad. You know, my, my, for me, I, I have a high degree of mobility as a co so I use a Blackberry and I use iPad mini. That's, that's my road warrior tools, right? And there's a pretty good size difference. I look at the big iPad 9, 9 inch, and the, to me it's a boat anchor. I don't want to carry anything that big and that heavy. But this is a good combination. Now, the ironic thing is that the MacBook Air that I have in my, um, my, my backpack over there, it's got better battery life than either, either one of these. 24 hours of battery life and continuous use. And it also has the most flexible input. It's instant on, I got a great keyboard, great screen. And so, you know, maybe the answer for making an invest mobility isn't about smartphones or tablets for your organization. Maybe it's for long life tablets with, you know, I mean, um, Ultras, you know, so Surface Pro, MacBook Airs. Maybe that's what mobility is for a given organization. It's not about phones at all. You said you were involved with the Bank of America app. Yeah. Do yeah. you use it? I use it all the time, yeah. 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 Actually, you know, I did the original research. Um, on the security side, the, the last company was based on a lot of security and um, when MasterCard bought that, um, you know, one of the things we had found is that mobile inherently is more secure. I know it, fly, it flies in the face of everything, but it's inherently more secure than the desktop environment for a couple of reasons. Um, the first is that 
there's no big target for the malfeasance to go after. Right? There's like 11 operating systems in the wild out there. And when you look at just Android, there's, there's like six. Right? And so if you're going to thief, what are they going to do? They, they want a big target. You know, it's a game of numbers for those guys and gals. Right? So you have a fractured operating system environment. Second is, how does most theft occur? You click on a link in an email, or you click on a bad link in a browser, or you download a picture that's got a virus that attacks a DLL or replaces or substitutes a DLL in your Windows environment. Well, there's no such concept in the architecture of any of the operating systems in, in mobile. There's no such things as DLLs. So they haven't figured out. I mean, fraud on mobile phones is really limited to a link where you start dialing a long distance porn number that gets billed back to your account. That's really what it comes down to. That's fraud. Everything else is nuisance. I don't know anybody that's had a phone that has had it shut down and made bricked because of malware. I don't know anybody that's had credentials stolen out of a mobile banking app produced by one of the top five banks. I do know people who have had their credentials stolen by using non-bank, non-regulated payment schemes, primarily because they were entering their credentials to the crook. So I scan checks. I, I work with Medtronic, uh, not Medtronics, but um, Joe DiBello. I, I can't think of his company now, but the, the original scanning. So I did it for USSA, then, then, uh, then we ported it to uh, Bank of America, and then it's kind of took off since then. But that scanning technology is very secure. I do remote deposit. Right. I pay bills on my phone. I buy stocks on my phone, too. Don't, don't most of the uh, smaller banks uh, outsource the functions? Have what? Outsource those functions. Outsource what functions? The, the, uh, banking. No, they, uh, they actually all keep it in-house. There was one company, Firethorn, that was mostly cloud-based, and they were pretty much aligned with AT&T. Qualcomm bought them, didn't do anything with them, and they went south. It seems like a huge expense for small banks. It, well, it is. I mean, most of the small banks use a company called Monetize out of Europe today, or, or Medivani, or Jack Henry. And most of those are managed by the third-party provider. Um, but it doesn't, dis you know, it's still connected on-prem. And they, a lot of them will do on-prem, off-prem service. Yeah, that's what you meant, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, time for one more question. One more question is good. We only did like four slides, so I feel really good. <laughs> With regard to using the mobile and the phone, what's your opinion of near field hacking? NFC near field or near proximity in general? NFC. You know, I, um, I think, I think uh, low-power Bluetooth negates the need for NFC. Um, not everybody agrees with that opinion, but we still have a lot of cost issues to get NFC um, down to where it makes sense in a lot of the phones. You don't have an evangelist, right? So Samsung and the Android community is not stepping up and saying we got to have NFC. Apple's not standing up and saying we got to have NFC. The only one that's toyed with it has been Nokia on the Windows phone. And even in the last two revisions, they didn't, they didn't do it. So um, I, I think where NFC had a chance um, was every place but payments, all about peripheral connectivity, um, tracking in stores for inventory, remote printing, so you know, tap and print. And I think it's, the thing to do is if you start seeing more momentum around that, then you could say, well, maybe NFC will begin to take off. But I, I guarantee you it's not going to take off in payments. And it may not even take off in these other areas because low-power Bluetooth is just so much more efficient. And the chips are already cheaper than dirt. And, you know, iPhone 5 already supports it. Samsung supports it. It's already there. So.
I don't think NFC is going to make it. Tramalto and some of the other companies in that space are not going to be happy, but that's just the way it is. I guess it's the last one. Will the FCC regulate the mobile providers as common carriers? Well, I think they already think they do. <laughs> it's a great question. Uh, I hesitate to answer it directly because uh, Tom Wheeler, uh, who I, I know, comes out of the wireless industry, right? And, uh, and I think that Tom is going to do whatever he can to not, not force that or, or, or not make it happen. I think they're going to keep them separate from Wireline. I mean, that's really what you're asking, right? Come under the same regulations as Wireline. Um, uh, net neutrality and all that sort of stuff. Yeah, I, I think net neutrality is, uh, I mean, that's another horn's nest. Um, but I think it's really the broadband providers and the, the traditional common carrier guys that are making most of the noise, not, not the wireless guys. Because yeah. the wireless guys, there's no such thing as net neutrality, right? It's all tier-based pricing. And it's going to get worse, right? So you're going to get, um, you know, with these new MMS, uh, IMS uh, properties coming up, you know, you're going to be able to get these plans that we talked about. But today it's best effort messaging, best effort video, best effort voice, right? In the next few years, where carriers are going to move to some of these other price points, is you're going to buy a bronze, a platinum, or a silver level of video delivery, high def, for example, versus standard def. That's where they're going to go. And by reference, that's not net neutrality, right? I just want to make two points. One is that Bob's available afterwards for questions, and also he's contributing editor at Forbes.com, so you can keep up with his latest. Please join me in thanking you. Thanks.